Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdell, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's November 2022, and this is episode 315, which is a spoiler-filled conversation about the television series Ozark, which is streaming on Netflix. On this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Joshua R. Ferris, who has a PhD in theology and religious studies. He is Humboldt experienced researcher at the University of Bochum in Germany, focusing on biologically engaged theological anthropology. Josh was written an online exclusive television series of the Netflix show Ozark for the Christian Research Journal. His review is called Breaking Bad Family in Ozark. And our subscribers can read his review for free at our website, equip.org. And if you don't already subscribe and want to get access to our online exclusive articles and reviews like this one, please go to equip.org where you can subscribe for $33.50. Joshua, it's good to have you on the podcast again. Good to be with you. Well, today we're talking about a Netflix television series called Ozark which just concluded its series finale earlier this year in 2022. It started back in 2017 and has a lot of notable actors, particularly Jason Bateman, who's in one of the starring roles, as well as Laura Linney. And it has received such great critical acclaim and fan acclaim. It's really racked up quite a few fans. In addition, Jason Bateman has won an Emmy for direction of episode in this series, as well as before this series, a lesser known actor. Her name is Julia Garner. And so far she has won three times for best supporting actress in a drama for Ozark. So it has gotten a lot of fan love as well as a lot of acclaim from critics. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the series and kind of an overview of what it's about? Yeah, good. Yeah, thank you. Um, Yeah, so Ozark is a fast-paced show. It starts off with a what you think of as an ordinary American family. And their lives become uprooted by one of the largest Mexican drug cartels. And so Jason Bateman plays Marty. He's one of the um, key characters in the show. Well, he and his wife, they both do a fantastic job acting. But Marty is the financial advisor, and he's working in this business with his partner. But his partner, he doesn't know this. His partner has been scheming and stealing from the drug cartel. Not a very smart thing to do. And they're caught. And so the drug lord meets with them. And Marty learns all of that. This is all a revelation to Marty. And so Marty tries to save his friend. He loves his friend. He cares for him. You you can tell that. He tries to convince the drug lord, you know, don't hurt him. Uh, We'll make it up. We can launder some money safely and successfully for you. But it's too late for his partner. And so the rest of the story centers around the Bird family, uh, Marty and Wendy and their two kids, Charlotte and Jonah. And you see that after this decision, it appears that Marty himself is going to die as well. He's held at gunpoint, but he makes a deal with the drug cartel and he promises them that he can make them basically a lot more money through this laundering and he can do so safely and successfully. And so the rest of the story follows from that traumatic moment. And so he convinces the drug cartel to give him a chance. And then he and his family have to uproot from Chicago And then they have to move to this place called Ozark, Missouri. And during this time, uh, Wendy, Marty's wife, is uh, having an affair. And there's this uh, key scene where he gives her advice and he instructs her. He says, hey, don't do anything. We're about to leave. This is very serious, so on and so forth. And her partner, who she's having an affair with, tells her, get your money out and put it in an account to save yourself. And she does that despite what Marty advises her to do. 
And uh, what's important about that scene, I think, is really key is this sets up this whole trajectory in the rest of the show. And you realize certain things about both Marty's character and Wendy's character. That choice created a ripple effect of sort of bad effects that follow from the decision. It doesn't work out well. And so this is where the story begins in episode one of season one. And uh, it's pretty fast paced from there. There's a lot of complicated uh, scenarios and there's a tremendous amount of character development. There's some exciting things that go on and um, there's a lot of uh, negotiating back and forth between Marty and the drug cartel, Marty and others in terms of this new business venture that he's on. And so when he gets to the Ozarks, he's over a series of time, he, he tries to find a couple of different places where he can launder money. And eventually they take ownership of a casino and this becomes the place where they can continue laundering money. And so in short, that's kind of the basic premise. That's the context. And that's where the story begins. Well, I want to ask you this next question right up front, because some of our listeners might be wondering, why are we reviewing this Netflix series in the first place? It is rated for mature audience. It has in the first season and in episode two of the second season, explicit sexual scenes, brief, but they're there as well as in the first two seasons and then briefly and elsewhere, they have female nudity, but mainly it's a hard R because of violence and language. And honestly, it's a descent into a lot of very disturbing criminal activity, given what you just summarized for us about the actual premise of the show. And so what is there to be gained from watching Ozarks? And are there Christians who should not be watching Ozark? And how do we approach that? Because that's a question we get all the time. And I have told our listeners in the past that we have resources on our website that we talk about why we even review television. We have an article on cultural apologetics, a few of them on there for that. And then also years ago, we did publish an article called that television is the new literature. So mainly people around us who we're sharing Christ with don't read books, they watch TV series. But even then, we have to be discerning about what we should watch. And so this one has some of those kind of moments that need to be fast forwarded, and they're troubling. So why would someone gain anything from this series? Yeah, good question. So I I think obviously, um, any shows you intend to watch or anything you intend to read. I think you need to go in with a critical mind. You need to go in cautiously. And obviously you need to have the sort of right uh, mentality or attitude when you're going in to watch any show. I mean, there's a tendency to, I, I think the danger is the tendency to watch shows in a way that is just an opportunity to kind of brain dump, you might call it, or veg out. I think that's uh, people get into these habits where they just use TV as a, a way of an escape or to veg out. And that's I think that's very dangerous. I think it's a bad habit to establish for your internal life. And so there are aspects of this show that um, are certainly corrupt. It touches on deep corruption, but it also touches on some cultural patterns that are reflected in our American context. And it also touches on some deeper relational, social, political patterns that give you a kind of secondhand experience or access into these situations that you can actually conceive of to some extent happening. You can imagine something like this happening. And what would you do in these circumstances if you were confronted So it's better, I think, in many ways to think about these things before you enter into these experiences where you have to make these hard decisions. And I I think uh, not that uh, most people are going to experience uh, what uh, Marty and Wendy experience, but they may experience other complicated moral decisions that they have to make and situations that maybe catch them off guard. And if they haven't uh, thought about it beforehand, 
uh, they might be just caught up into it. And, and so many times when we make bad decisions, it's because we're caught up in it and we haven't had the time to really process it or think through it carefully. This particular show is, I would say, primarily uh, rated TVMA for pretty extreme violence and cursing. Now, there are some, especially in season one, and then there's at least one in season two, uh, there are some sexual scenes. But those are really not, I, I guess you would say, those are really kind of incidental to the show. That's not what the show is really about. The violence, I would say, the violence and the cursing is really... Well, it's kind of true to the nature of the show itself. You're dealing with the drug cartel. And when you dishonor the drug cartel or the drug lord, things happen. It's like in the old mafia stories where you have um, Al Capone. When somebody dishonored Al Capone and doesn't come through with what they agreed upon, well, he sends his Guzik figure to go uh, break some legs. And that's what (laughs) that's just the reality Cursing is a common part of the show, but you have to keep in mind that you're dealing with certain subcultures within America that often that's part and parcel of of the culture that they're a part of. You're dealing with a Midwest redneck hillbilly cultures, and this is part of the culture. So I would just say that as a preface, even though there are these immoral things going on, there is something to be gained and I think in a similar way that when you, when you think about Aristotle's instructions, Aristotle gives instructions about tragedy, and he says, well, we can actually gain something from tragedy as a way of gaining some sort of second-person perspective on reality through the actors playing roles. We can envision or imaginatively see through their eyes without actually being in those situations. And I think that can be very helpful. So I think there is much to be gained from the show. It's a very well-written show. The characters are deep characters. There's a lot of character development, and there's a lot of complicated, convoluted situations that people find themselves in sometimes due to their own bad decisions, sometimes due to accidental circumstances that they did not control. And that's that's conducive to life. That's the way it is. I mean, we find ourselves in difficult decisions at times, maybe not quite this extreme, of course, but maybe other situations where we're given the opportunity, maybe in business, to uh, skim a little money off or whatever the situation may be. There are decisions that we have and will be confronted with in our daily lives, in our families, in our businesses, in our jobs, in dealing with others, in dealing in politics, where we are going to be confronted with hard decisions that have moral implications. And so the Ozark Show presents that to us in a very clear and provocative and emotionally um, profound way, I guess you'd say. It's November 2022 and Thanksgiving is coming up and I always want to be very thankful to all of our listeners and subscribers and the ways in which they partner with us. Now, if you are newer to the podcast and you're just discovering our content, you might be wondering how you can partner with us. Well, there's a lot of ways that you can do that. Firstly, just get the word out. I mean, tell a friend. We're so grateful for that. Share your favorite episode on social media or an email or just let someone know about how they can subscribe to this podcast. The other way that people can support us would be to subscribe to the magazine and you get access to all of the online content that you're seeing as well as you would get the most recent print edition straight to your door as well. And so that's all available at our website, equip.org to subscribe for $33.50. The other way that you can help us out if a subscription is not in your budget right now is just simply give us a tip. I mean, maybe stop a favorite coffee at your local coffee shop for a week or two and give us a tip for our content. Easy to do. Go on over to equip.org, hit journal. You'll see postmodern realities podcast. Click on that. And at any landing page, you'll find the link where you can give us a tip. And of course, we appreciate not just your financial support through a subscription or a tip, but also if you would just 
give us a rating or review. And Apple Podcasts really is the best way to do that. If you head on over to Apple Podcasts, of course, a star rating is a really quick way that you can help us out with the algorithm by you know, clicking the stars that you like for this podcast, but even better yet, just a short sentence or two really helps people to know why you listen to this podcast and if they should subscribe. I know that when I've come across podcasts, I always look at the reviews to see what others think about the content. So thank you for your support. We are really, truly grateful. Well, you were just kind of giving us the context of why this series is rated for mature audiences only. And of course, you mentioned Al Capone, but this is kind of, I would say, a modern day kind of American mob story, not the typical one set in New York City, but something of a new crime family being developed. So if anyone has watched any of those kinds of things in the past, The Godfather, whatever it is, you know, you know that there's drugs involved, violence involved and those kinds of things. So that's kind of what is being portrayed here. And you also mentioned just, well, we're going to talk about a little bit later. I want to ask you about decision-making and ethics, but I think all of us have probably run into some of the very similar things that are being portrayed here, either with people we know or stories we hear in our community, or even if some people of our listeners might be too young to know this, but you know, back in the days of Enron, people who were executives who ended up being confronted with certain business decisions that were being made, and then they made even worse decisions regarding that. Now they're in prison and, you know, the list goes on. There's people I voted for before that are now sitting in federal prison because they ended up bribing people. And supposedly they had, you know, this is also some part of the show they supposedly had good Christian morals or whatever. So I think all of us are, we can name all kinds of stories that are hit a little close to home for us. But why don't you describe who some of the major players are? Who are the characters that this series focuses on in addition to the main couple, Marty and Wendy Bird, who you just talked about? Yeah, I think I've explained Marty and a little bit about Wendy. One, I want to say um, uh, just a couple of additional details about Marty's wife, Wendy, because this, I, I think, provides some additional content to her character. She has a very strained relationship with her father, and her father seems to be a kind of authoritarian figure, alcoholic, who never accepted her. And so that plays into her character and I think some of the decisions she makes later on. But also, she was a big part of politics and there always seems to be this underlying desire. Her husband's in his career. You know, he does well. He's smart, very smart, savvy guy, makes good financial decisions. That's why he's a financial advisor. She's at home and she is, I think there's a desire to sort of gain some mobility in life. And so that's part that plays into both of their characters as they navigate the political realm of the drug cartel and the money laundering business that they take over. So those are the two main characters, of course. But there's also Charlotte Bird, who is the daughter of Marty and Wendy, and she becomes important in in various ways. There's Jonah, the son And he's certainly an important figure, very smart, like his father, uh, very capable financially, as well as he's very capable at, I guess, the IT world and things of that sort, very capable. So, But he also represents in the family kind of the moral fiber to some extent. He still has a, um, throughout the show, there's still some kind of glimmer of hope for him as he looks at his parents with a kind of disdain and because of their corruption and their lack of repentance at various points in the show. There's Ruth Langmore, played by Julie Garner. Excellent character. She is a young woman who's kind of a, you might call kind of a a redneck in the Midwest. She has a criminal family there. They caused a lot of trouble. She's caused some trouble as an adolescent, certainly, and she's got a record. But she also represents the kind of, um, I think when you watch it, you kind of hope, oh, she's, you want to see her be reformed. And then you also want to see her kind of mobilize upward. 
because she comes from a poor uh, sort of family and a criminal family. And then she starts reforming. She's very smart. She manages her own hotel. She works with Marty at the casino and she's very good at management. And so she kind of represents to some extent the American dream of, hey, anybody can kind of, if they work hard enough, they have some skills, they can move themselves up the ladder of success. And so you kind of have this hopefulness with Ruth. So she becomes a very important figure. Uh, Rachel Garrison becomes important early on as she is the owner of the Blue Cat Lodge, where the lodge and bar where Marty enters into a business relationship with her early on as part of his money laundering behind the scenes. There's some other characters, particularly Camino del Rio. He's a lieutenant in the Mexico's Navarro drug cartel. Darlene Snell will come up again. She's an important figure as the birds interact with the Snells uh, throughout seasons one through three. Uh, She becomes really important as she's married to Jacob, who owns a heroin business. And so she represents a kind of, you might say, hillbilly culture that, uh, a wealthy hillbilly culture, who became um, and uh, developed a lot of wealth through the drug business. And so they have a lot of interactions back and forth with uh, the bird in the Ozarks and with the, the Mexican drug cartel. There is. I think Helen Pierce is very important. She's a Chicago attorney for the cartels. That's right. Yeah. Helen Pierce is especially important in um, season two and season three. She is a Chicago based attorney who represents the cartel. And so she becomes close with the uh, the birds and especially with Wendy. And ultimately, the birds, you can tell, are making maneuvers. Wendy especially is making maneuvers to occupy the place, the kind of authority with the drug cartel that she occupies in season two and and much of uh, season three. So she's an important figure. Omar Navarro is uh, the leader of the Mexican drug cartel. And so in uh, season three and season four, you see him get closer to the birds. He gains trust in Marty. He likes Marty's business savvy ways. He trusts him. And so he's an important figure. Um, Javi, the Navarro's hothead nephew, lieutenant of the cartel later on, after the original lieutenant was was actually shot by uh, Darlene Snell in a kind of impulsive action. That kind of represents her character as well. When she gets mad, she just lets other people have it. And she does that in more than one case. In this case, she killed one of the lieutenants, which caused some trouble for her and the family. So Javi is a very important figure as he kind of steps in. He's not so trusting of the birds. And so the birds have to work with him, try to gain his trust, but also at the same time, try to manipulate him in a way that they can control him and gain power over him as well as gain power within the drug cartel. So he becomes an important figure, especially in season four. So there's a lot of characters. Those are probably the most predominant characters. I should mention one more, Yavi's mother, who really becomes a key figure in season four. And there's a lot of complicated social interactions between her and the birds and Omar, especially after her son is killed. And that becomes a rather complicated decision in the rest of the show. And uh, she becomes an important figure that uh, eventually vies for the authority or the power in the drug cartel. And actually, in many ways, Wendy sets up Yavi's mother to be in a position of power because she makes some uncalculated decisions once again, which Marty advises her not to, but she decides anyway to do it behind his back which is a consistent theme with Wendy and Marty. This whole power dynamic is present in the show. So that's uh, the, there's a lot of characters, a lot of important characters. Those are some of the probably the most important characters in the show. So we've talked about how this is kind of a descent for this family into kind of a life of criminal activity And although they think it's a lot more gentrified what they're doing than, say, the Langmores, who they look down upon as like 
you know, working class people who are just like petty thugs kind of of folks. And it's interesting to see the evolution of that character, Ruth Langmore. But what are some of the big themes that this show tackles? Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, I would say certainly there are themes of the American dream that are present. And so you have this American dream where anybody who works hard enough, who kind of picks their, can pick themselves up by their own bootstraps, they can become successful in, a, in America. And so you really see that in different ways in, in Ruth, especially, as well as some other characters. You see some other themes about family. Family becomes really important, and I hope I will probably talk more about that because I think that's really a key factor that we can, as as Christian apologists, that's something that we can think about more clearly. And I think the show actually does help us think about family more carefully, especially as family is understood within our own culture and how the, the, the different dynamics between the husband and wife Um, kind of play out in some ways. So family becomes a big theme. Uh, You might uh, also say that um, there's the theme of the, um, is this about politics or religion, the justification of money laundering in some cases? Is it about the highest value, the family? Because you see several times in the show where people justify immoral decisions for the ends that they create or for the sake of the family? Do the ends justify the the means? And so that comes up as a rationale in the show quite frequently. In fact, in many cases, Wendy makes this justification herself when she makes some pretty immoral decisions. One of the most important quotes by her is, she says, quite frankly, I don't give a D-A-M-N if you like it or not, because I feel pretty good about it. It's a good idea. And I did it for our family. What did you do today for our family? And so she uses this ends justify the means rationale. And she even says, well, it's for the sake of the family. So it's justified. It's okay, whatever, whatever she ends up doing. Even killing somebody is okay, as long as it's for the family. So there's a lot of other different themes and even themes that are picked up in the blogosphere about the show. For example, is it a picture of American privilege or a white privilege? Or is it a picture of the American dream in general? Or is it about capitalist corruption? And so you have some reflecting on that issue. Uh, Is it a picture about nihilism? You certainly see this present in the family experiences as they experience a decline in morality where any sort of moral framework is just doesn't seem to be worth anything at all anymore, except for pure pragmatic ends of bringing them success, power, and money to satiate their greed. So those are some of the big themes that are represented. Now, one of the major things that happens among fans of these kinds of shows is it's really being compared to Breaking Bad, and people have very strong opinions as to which show is better and which one seems darker. So why do you think that Ozark is being compared to Breaking Bad beyond, obviously, kind of the theme of, you know, Breaking Bad was a teacher descending into the meth business? But besides the drug theme, why do people compare both of the shows? Yeah, because they're both morally based in many ways. And the the characters that make these series of bad, immoral decisions become morally wicked. So I do think there are some comparisons, some similarities between the two shows. Both are good shows in, in that they both display a real moral core or uh, moral realism that there is a moral law or that there are real moral ideas in the world that we should follow, moral principles, but they also display the potential of total depravity or total corruption. As these characters continue making a series of bad decisions, they themselves become moral wastelands. They become just wicked, corrupt people. So There is that similarity. I mean, certainly Marty is in some ways similar to um, 
Walter in the show. I mean, they're both common men, common talented, though, generally intelligent. Actually, they're both more than, in, I mean, they're very intelligent people. Obviously, Walter's um, a teacher. I think he's a little bored. I mean, he's he's kind of, you might say in, in some sense, he probably feels a little like he's too smart for this. He, he wants to do something else. They both are kind of passive figures early on, at least. And so they're similar in that way. And then in an interesting turn, Wendy takes on the characteristics, many characteristics of Walter in Breaking Bad. Wendy, like Walter, she becomes this um, uh, psychopath. I forget the distinction between psychopath and sociopath. But anyway, she becomes like Walter in that way. She gets so caught up in her decisions that she loses what appears to be any moral framework. And um, that just doesn't factor in for her anymore. She's lost it. And so we see that with Walter as well. But one of the things that is different, I mean, early on in the show, Walter does justify the means by the ends when he talks about his family as a justification for what he's doing. But that quickly changes as the show progresses, whereas the family becomes a central theme throughout the whole of the Ozark show. Uh, so that that's a difference. So you have this real focus on Walter and his moral decay. In the Ozark show, you have uh, the moral decay of especially Marty and Wendy, but um, there's a bigger picture here, and that's what happens in the whole family dynamic. And so I think that's one place in which the two shows are similar but different, and in different important ways in ways that Ozark actually does become a real contribution to film. But it also opens up and prompts other deeper questions that we can think about as Christians in our own culture and how it is that this moral decline not only affects individuals, but how the moral decline affects communities and fundamentally the community of the family. And so I think the show depicts that really powerfully. And so I think that's one of the big distinctions between Breaking Bad and Ozark. So exactly how do you see Ozark in a distinctive way being different from Breaking Bad and why you chose to focus on it for the discussion of decision-making theory? Because I've seen other Christians say that there's more redemptiveness in Breaking Bad than there is in Ozark, which is completely dark. Yeah, that's a good... Well, yeah, again, I think the fundamental difference between the two shows is that we see that it's not just about individual decision-making. It's not just about the decisions that I make. When I enter into the world, I am a part of a community and that community in some real ways, I think real ways, arguably, provides a structure for me. And there are certain things in my life and in, from my family situation, from my society, and for all of us, that shapes and molds us in ways that can be good or bad. And I think that's where Ozark stands out, as it depicts the family itself as an important theme within our culture and something that we need to be aware of as Christians as we think about the moral decline of society. I think there's a parallel between the moral decline of society and the breakdown of a family, as the family is the kind of foundation, arguably, for society, as we see in Scripture and in history. There are important parallels to reflect on and think about that we see um, acted out in Ozark that we don't see as clearly in the show Breaking Bad, because the Breaking Bad really becomes... To a large extent, it becomes about this individual, uh, Walter, who lives his own life. And early on, he kind of separates himself from his family. Whereas Ozark highlights the family throughout and the dynamics that change as they experience greater moral decline. So I think Breaking Bad, there is kind of a redemption at the end of the show or the final series that I remember 
He comes to his senses in some respects, and he admits the wrong that he's done. Whereas in Ozark, you don't see that. In fact, you see further moral decline as it spreads to the rest of the family. And I think it depicts that quite well, especially as we see the two children join into the family business eventually. The daughter first, and then the son. Certainly the son is not a morally upright figure in the show. I mean, he's helping Ruth uh, with an illegal business in the show, but he still seems to have some kind of moral compass. He still seems to show some sign of hope that maybe, and the daughter too at parts of the show, she does show signs of hope as well. But then later on in the show, it's pretty clear she's joined. She wants to become a part of the business. She wants to learn. She's asking questions. She's a lot more sort of sympathetic to her parents, whereas the son is kind of He's really angry at his parents, but eventually he buckles as well. And that becomes an interesting part of the show that depicts the fact that our decisions don't just affect us. They affect other people, especially when it comes to the family. Well, I want to focus on that right now and just ask you a little bit about decision-making theory. I don't know that a lot of us all the time have really given a lot of thought to how we make decisions and what does that mean for the Christian and how should we as Christians make decisions founded on and really grounded in a Christian worldview and and based on scripture? Yeah, I think decision-making is really complicated in some ways and simple in other ways. I mean, we make decisions every day, but oftentimes we make decisions without much um, conscious reflection on all the variables and, and the possible outcomes depending on the decisions we make. I think the show is important, again, as I said, when we think about Aristotle's belief that tragedy becomes an important lens for us for thinking about and reflecting on difficult life decisions. Tragedy in some ways is common to life, and it gives us a lens into the lives of characters that are not our own. It enables us to imaginatively see our world in the future before we get there so that we can think about the ramifications and consequences of different decisions that we make. And so decision-making theory is important, I think, because... It gives us tools, additional tools, to think carefully and critically about hard or complicated, sometimes convoluted decisions that we have in life to make. So when we think about decision-making, especially moral decision-making in our lives, there's different facets of a decision we have to think about. We have to think about the persons, the relations we're in, the different attitudes, the desires, and the future options that might entail or ensue from the decisions we make. There's also other decisions that decision-making theorists would say they need to be ranked in some way. So decision-making theorists talk about ordinal utilities that refer to the desirability and ordering relation of different values. There's also cardinalistic utilities that place a value on the distance or relation between the different options that are available before you. And so moral decision making really is a kind of a cost benefit analysis, a cost benefit analysis, looking at what are the different options before me? What are the outcomes that I want? Or what are the objectives that I hope to achieve? And what's the best way with the least amount of cost? What's the best way forward? And so that might sound a bit pragmatic, but I think uh, sometimes a little pragmatism is okay. But all practical decisions are going to be guided by the values that we have, whether explicitly or implicitly, consciously or subconsciously. And hopefully they lead toward a place of virtue, that they make us more virtuous in the long run. And so I think moral decision-making theory gives us tools for thinking about this. And the Ozark show gives us concrete case studies to imaginatively think through 
different decisions we might have to make in life as Christians or as citizens, as family members, as uh, businessmen. And so it gives us clear, provocative examples that we can reflect on before we enter into those decisions. And I think this is important as I think about, like, for example, raising up my daughter and discipling her. There's a lot of things that she's not going, as a three-year-old, she's not going to quite understand or be able to articulate. She's going to be, and even now, I mean, as a three-year-old, she has all sorts of decisions she's got to make in life in some ways. And she is bombarded with a lot going on in front of her. I think one of the helpful things as a good parent to help guide them through different decisions that they might make in the future before they get to those decisions so that they are at least prepared to helpfully, critically, carefully, wisely navigate those choices in life. And so by helping them see those circumstances, even setting up scenarios where you walk with them through it and then try to explain it afterwards, it helps develop categories and uh, tools to navigate life. So that's what I would say. I think moral decision-making theory is really helpful in that way. So what about some of the cultural themes that you saw in the show? You talked earlier in the podcast about things being particularly American culturally, and how does that raise questions we need to reflect on in terms of decision-making that you were just talking about? You know, I'm, I'm in Germany right now, and I've had these conversations about the American dream with some of my German friends. I've had it with some of my European friends. And I think there's a lot about the American dream that's really good and arguably beautiful. But there are certain habits that I, I realize that I think are quite common habits or patterns in American culture that we see reflected in, in the show. There are ways in which the American dream can go wrong. I think there's something good and beautiful insofar as there is this impulse in the American dream or the American experience to suggest that anyone can climb up the ladder of success, no matter their sort of origins, their family, their inheritance, financial as well as moral inheritance, they can make themselves better as a result. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I think we can point to historical examples where that's the case. On the other hand, though, there are habits, I think, of overworking in America. I think arguably working too much, becoming workaholics, at least uh, certainly the Europeans look at us and they say one of their critiques is you work too much, you work too hard. But you're also your standard of living is much higher than what we have here. And um, I think there's habits, there's desires that are prevalent in our culture that the show represents uh, quite, quite well. There's this desire to not only gain power, but to satiate our desire to make a certain amount of money, to live in a certain style of house to uh, drive a certain number of cars, to drive a certain kind of car. And those all seem very superficial, but I'd be surprised if most would say this is not a common problem for middle to upper middle class families. I mean, I I think it's um, kind of built into our DNA to some extent. But relatedly, there's this theme of decadence. Uh, The American dream has led many social commentaries to a critique that it quickly becomes a life about decadence, both in the sense that life is an idolatry of work represented throughout. We see Marty and Wendy's life. All of their values are ordered by these decisions that they've made related to work, that they have made an idol that has ordered all of their life And despite what they say about, well, we're doing this for the family, in many ways, it seems that they're doing this for the sake of greed and for the sake of power. Wendy is consumed with this, it seems, upward mobilization of power. I think 
like I said before, her character represents a kind of desire to be successful. When she was back in Chicago, she wanted to be a, in, in politics. And Marty represents this sort of fiscally conservative, smart, savvy guy, but he gets a taste for power as well, I think. And so you see that dynamic played out. But that becomes another important theme in terms of American marriage challenges. I, I don't think it's any coincidence that, especially when you look at American statistics, most marriages that fail are a result of finances. And it's not because a lot of those families are not making what would be a somewhat fairly comfortable wage or salary. But nonetheless, they are so consumed with a certain kind of living style that requires a certain kind of financial pay uh, that, anyway, it just becomes the number one reason why families break down and why even why wives leave their husbands. Typically, that's one of the main motivators that we see. I think there's other themes as well that are important. This theme of America, too, has hierarchies. We often think about America as being the sort of egalitarian society. We care about the equality of all people. We care about the equality of everyone, no matter their history, uh, their race, their gender, so on and so forth. But nonetheless, we, we still have hierarchies in America, and these hierarchies play into how our culture and society is structured. And so that being aware of those different structural or cultural uh, proclivities are important when we think about our own blind spots and the temptations that we, we will or may have in this society as we uh, seek to climb up the ladder of success. There's also this theme, I think this is an important theme, is I, this really comes out quite clearly in the show, and you can see this in the blogosphere. There, Some writers talk about this explicitly, others implicitly, but there's this sort of female heroine turned villain theme. It's not a coincidence that uh, in reflecting a sort of more egalitarian culture, since the 70s, females have been occupying the, the roles of men more and more. And you see this especially depicted in, in shows like, um, I think the first show that had a real impact on our culture was um, that was played by a female character in a leadership role. What was it the Mary Tyler Moore show? I think it was. Is that what it's called? Mary Tyler yeah, Moore? Yeah, there's Mary Tyler Moore. And that was like the single gal who was working in a newsroom, which at the time, I think it was, did it, was it on in the seventies maybe? Yeah. Um, and maybe even before that, I don't know, Marlo Thomas and that girl, that's before my time that was in the sixties, but Mary Tyler Moore for sure was very much different than shows of the past. Even when she was on the Dick Van Dyke show as a, as a wife and they had, you know, her and her husband, Rob, sleeping in separate twin beds and stuff. So she really was kind of showing this new kind of independent woman that maybe in the 1970s when it's not the start of feminism, but it was more on the rise then in terms of just showing female independence. So that was for sure a part of that television series. Yeah, that's right. So that's just one example, but we're seeing a lot more of that now. And as even in recent years, in the 90s and the 2000s, even more so, we're seeing a lot more female heroines in, in shows and in, in film and movies. We're also seeing a lot more female superheroes. And it's interesting that we're seeing this sort of dominance in our culture being depicted through film. But we see it also in the Ozark show, where there is this sort of dominant female leadership. I think it's overwhelming. I mean, maybe somebody could argue push back against it. But I think, uh, especially on the American side, we see female leaders are dominating in, in sort of uh, driving the show and making the decisions. Certainly Ruth Langmore is an important figure as she is in many ways the leader in her family. She makes the decisions for her cousins and she's the one who's the calculated one. 
And so she's a leader who experiences real upward mobility in the show. But then, of course, uh, another good example is Darlene Snell. And she represents Hillbilly Wealth, like I said before. She doesn't always make the smartest decision. She's very impulsive, especially when she gets angry. Like, for example, when she shot and killed uh, the lieutenant in, in the drug cartel. But even worse, there's another episode later on in the show where she can tell her husband is not going to make the hard decisions to keep the family name, to keep the business going strong. He's not going to make the hard decisions to do so. So what does she do? Well, she kills her husband. But we see this theme. We see it in Wendy as well. Wendy, I think, is overwhelmingly the... I, you do have power dynamics between her and, and Marty, but I think she's the dominant lead. She makes the decisions, and when she decides to make a decision, she oftentimes doesn't talk to Marty. Not that I'm suggesting she needs to consult him or ask him his permission or something, but she doesn't even talk to him. She just goes behind his back and does it, and it's disastrous sometimes. But she displays this dominant female leadership. And the, on the Mexican side, you have this historical sort of passing down of leadership and authority roles. But toward the end of the show, it is the female who runs the drug cartel at the end. It's Javi's mother. And so there's this overwhelming emphasis upon the female. But it's not a female heroine. These are all villain characters. But again, this plays into the whole theme of marriage as well that we see and, and common marriage challenges in American culture right now. As women are occupying these roles, they're not dependent upon their husbands anymore in the way that they once were. There's this certain quality of life that seems to be driving the decisions as a value that they're making. They are much more career driven and in many cases financially superior to their husbands. So they just don't depend on them anymore. So relationships, structures are changing and they're changing in dramatic ways. And it seems apparent to me that this is a big factor in at least why families are not succeeding. Divorce is still a big issue for us, even as Christians. So this gives us an opportunity to really think about these things and think about the cares of the world and how they zap life out of us, but also how they, can, they just condition us to reorient or reorder our values and how we make decisions. So whatever you make of the sort of hierarchies and the hierarchies in the family and leadership, it's certainly a big change from um, historically. So it's something that we need to think carefully about a lot more carefully than we have thus far. Yes. And, you know, just to piggyback on what you were saying about the strong female characters, and by the way, I was correct, it was Mary Tyler Moore show was in the 70s, is that even in this, in the quote unquote good guys in this series is one of the female characters is an FBI agent who's a forensic accountant named Maya, but she's also doing her job while she's pregnant. And then when she has her baby, she's still, you know, involved with the birds and all kinds of other things that are you know, some plots having to do with the FBI. So it is really interesting that they have so many strong female characters. And also just the attorney that we mentioned briefly, Helen Pierce, it's like she's in the middle of a divorce, but the impression is given is her husband's clueless. He has no idea what his wife does for a living at all. So I thought I thought that was very interesting because a lot of times traditionally it's been swapped. The husband's involved in some nefarious business and the wife doesn't know anything about it. But speaking of family, one of the interesting things to me on the show, I know some viewers think that there's not any morality in it, is just the question about not just the family loyalty that always comes up, it seems to me, in any kind of mob type series. You know, you have to be loyal to the family, which is going on here for sure. But also the idea of 
What is driving them to do some of these things for their family members, whether it's for Wendy, she says she's doing it for her children and that she loves her children and that she would be absolutely devastated if they couldn't stay together as a family, that everything she's doing is for them. Meanwhile, her children have great animosity, especially their youngest son, Jonah, towards his parents and their activities, their criminal activity. And so just the idea of what is love, because in one sense, you know, Wendy will say that she loves people. And there's another subplot with her mentally ill brother who's bipolar named Ben in season three. But yet Wendy's responsible for his demise and that causes her to go in a tailspin. But I found that one of the most interesting scenes in the whole entire series happens In season four and episode 10, between Marty Bird, who's gone down to Mexico to kind of like run the cartel briefly, and a Roman Catholic priest who I think is an employee of the cartel. And he, Marty has just um, called for the execution of one of the top lieutenants of the, who has been skimming money against the cartel. And so they're sitting on the steps and they start having a conversation about the love of God. And Marty says that he finds the love of God to be very arbitrary. And so Marty says, well, like, why are you working for this cartel? And and the priest says, well, I go where God is most needed. And Marty says, well, nothing comes out without conditions. And the priest responds, do you love unconditionally? Marty replies, I'm not sure it's the smartest thing to do. And the priest said, are you loving or are you judging? If your love is conditional, it's also transactional. Love doesn't keep score, Marty. It's not self-seeking. And then Marty says, I think it's easier said than done. And so my wonder in this entire series is, does anyone truly love one another? That's what they say they're doing this for. Now, I do think at a deeper level, maybe Ruth loves her cousin Wyatt And that's kind of, you know, everything she's done. And when he dies, it's kind of like, really, she dies inside too. I mean, everything that seals Ruth's fate has to do with the death of her cousin, Wyatt, who she hopes can get out of this life of crime. But is anyone loving anybody else truly? Or is everyone doing what is right for themselves and self-seeking, even quote unquote, the good guys like the FBI? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, love is a really important theme in the show. I think that uh, exchange between Marty and the priest is really, really powerful. Yeah, Ruth, I think you brought up a good example with Wyatt. I think also she really did love the brother of um, Ben. uh, Ben. Yes, Woody Bird's brother. Mm -hmm. That's right. I think she really loved or at least deeply cared for him. So you saw her sink into a depression. Eventually she kind of figures out what happened. And um, I think she loved him as well as her cousin. But obviously when we see she loses her cousin, she kind of loses everything. She loses it. She kind of, I don't remember how quickly it happened, but she kind of went on a rampage to uh, a vengeance rampage. And so that was very dark uh, and very sad, but you could kind of resonate with her a little bit. I mean, it's, your whole family is taken from you. Your whole structure, your whole meaning, meaningful structure, reason for living is taken from you. Well, that drives people to do pretty crazy things. But yeah, does anybody else love? I mean, I think um, it's interesting when Wendy has conversations with Marty, she has a couple of what seem like unselfish moments. At one point, She's made this difficult decision against Marty's advice regarding the Navarro family, and particularly um, Javi's uh, mother. And there's a whole slew of complications that follow from that. And at one point she says to Marty, this is actually right after he went on a rampage because he was so angry at her that he went and he beat up a guy in the middle of traffic. I mean, this little financial advisor, he's not very strong, but he he just lets it all out. His anger, he has so much pent up anger and he, he takes it out on this other person. But after that moment, Wendy makes these sort of revelatory comments. She comes to, or at least she sounds a bit more selfless. She says, look, we'll get through this. 
I completely understand if you want to leave me at the end. I'm not an easy person to love. And it's, you kind of think, well, that's kind of honest. But it's also coming from a, a dark place in her where her father has told her she's not easy to love. And so she kind of confronts that. And another place, though, she when she's talking to Marty, she says love becomes a kind of manipulative tool. She says something to the effect of, if you love me, you will go through with this. You'll do this for me. And again, it's an immoral, I can't remember the details, but it's an immoral decision. And she asks him to do something immoral on her behalf if he loves her. But I, I don't know, I think in a maybe in a weird way, Marty's whole conception of love, especially after these decisions that he makes in the show, seems to be, like you said, transactional. It is very conditional. I mean, and that fits in part, not only with his own moral sensibilities that have developed over time, but it fits in part with his personality. He's a very calculating financial advisor, right? So in some ways, he's being practical when he says that. Love is transactional. You give something and you get back something. There's something to be gained in the process. Does he love his wife? I don't know. He sticks with her. He stays with her. And it seems that through all of their like horrendous decisions, they develop some kind of bond with one another that I think may be suggestive that their loyalty at least develops in the process. I don't know if it's love, but that's a good question. I think... Well, they say, I love you to one another, but I don't know what that really means because when Marty is ruminating on the meaning of love with the priest, I don't know if he's realized that everything he does for Wendy is transactional. Yeah, I think even why he stays with her, I think, is transactional as well. Yeah, I tend to think that. His kids see it as well. I mean... In the show, his kids comment on it, and they're like, this is right before the kids are about to leave Marty and Wendy and go live with their grandfather. They have this opportunity. But they have, like, this striking moment where they're like, they tell their dad, basically, like, why, why are you still here? Why are you listening to her still? And they, they make a comment. It's quite a commentary. They make a commentary about his life even before they got into this business, that he would just kind of follow her, even though she did things out of selfishness for her own reasons. And he continues in that pattern even after the business. And I don't know what you call that, but I, there's this unhealthy dynamic that he's kind of dependent on her in some way to kind of lead the way. I don't know, maybe he gets some excitement out of it. He finds some challenge in it. I, I don't know what it is, but there's some sort of unhealthy dynamic there where he seems to be dependent on her. And that whole dynamic, he seems to be dependent on in some way. So I want to ask you kind of two things. First of all, I want to come back to Breaking Bad and also the show. The show has a very polarizing series ending. A majority of the people did not like the series ending. And so what do you make of the ending? It is tragic. It's a little bit left, not open, but there's some room for interpretation as to what is happening or how people see or why everything is not so neatly tied up in a bow. So there are many fans that thought the ending was not good. And then after we talk about the ending, I just want to get your thoughts on why, you know, coming back to the very beginning, why should the Christian apologist really care? about this series. I think there's a lot of things to discuss with people. And also, we didn't even get into it. But one thing I would encourage our listeners, if they do end up viewing the show, is to think through the nature of what is truth, because everyone lies about everything in the show, from the kids, from the attorneys, from the mobsters, from Wendy and Marty. It's just a continual just web of lies. And even in trying to deal with the FBI, there's, you know, there's even the FBI's methods, we realize, well, are they really caring about truth or they just need to show that they're having action on the drug war and all these kinds of things. So that's something we didn't get into, but it's something that people should really think about the nature of what that is compared to what the Bible talks about as truth. But 
What about the ending? And then what's the value for the Christian apologists as they interact with folks who might be fans of the show? Yeah. So the ending is a, it's an ambiguous ending to some extent, but um, as you see the moral decline and you see the whole family is brought into that moral decline, I, I think that's important. The very last show, you see the son act in a way that signifies or symbolizes his identifying with his family. He is becoming a part of the family now. Despite his reservations before, despite his anger toward his parents because of their corruption, at the end, he seems to join with the family. So you have this sort of completion of moral decay where it extends beyond the individual to the family in in a way that I think this is where people rightly say that um, maybe Ozark is even more dark than Breaking Bad. But I I think... um, In important ways, that represents cultural values that are important. It represents the nature of marriage that's important. Marriage is, uh, we need to realize, I've dealt with this a lot over the years and just interacting with my own family members, uh, my extended family. When we talk about the nature of marriage, marriage is very private for many of them. It's their decision, right? And they're free to do what they want. At one level, they are. I mean, but... At another level, marriage is very much a public matter, and we see that in both good and bad ways in our culture, and in the show, we see it in a very bad way. It's very much a public arrangement that has public consequences. And I think in other ways, this reflects what the scriptures teach us. As much as we talk about individualism and you know, making our own path and doing the right thing and making good decisions as an individual. Those are all good things. But um, I do think there's an emphasis in scripture on the family as a unit and as the foundation of society. When we look at the Old Testament scriptures, the way that God seems to describe the family as being the basic social unit that he creates and designs, he designs it as part and parcel of the image of God and humanity, as the image of God, as image bearers were to procreate and by procreating take, in some way, take dominion over the earth, to uh, harness it, to order, to give order to it. And it's through the biological line of the family that we see throughout the Old Testament that God blesses the family. He gives life through the family. He blesses that. And on the other side, in many ways, there There's this complicated system of ethics in the Old Testament whereby when individuals or representatives in the family disobey God, they violate his law, there's a whole cycle of curses. So disobedience leads to curses. We see that in the Old Testament law. Obedience leads to blessing. We see that in the Old Testament law in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And that pattern becomes set up in in the whole early books, the king's and the Samuel books. So that family line is present. But what you see in the family is interesting is that um, what God intended for good, that he blesses, when used in the wrong way, it becomes a curse. And so in this way, what we find is we, we see exhibited in this very striking way, we see exhibited the curse of a family. And so that's why I call it Breaking Bad Families. In many ways, the birds uh, exemplify for us a family, not just an individual, that have gone wrong. So what God meant for good in the wrong hands becomes used for evil. Well, finally, on a much lighter note, it's November and it's almost Thanksgiving. So Joshua, what's your favorite Thanksgiving dish? That's a good one. Um, hmm. Not dessert, dish. Okay. Well, I think you could have it dessert be one of the dishes. Okay. I would say pecan pie. Well, pies are a big part of Thanksgiving. I hope you get to eat a pecan pie at Thanksgiving. And thank you for being a guest again on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Thank you. 
You've been listening to episode 315 and our discussion about the Netflix series Ozark. And I've been talking to Dr. Joshua R. Ferris, who has written an online exclusive television series review of the show for the Christian Research Journal. And his review is called Breaking Bad Family in Ozark. Our subscribers can read his review at our website, equip.org, for free. And anyone else who would like to receive the online exclusive access to this review, please go to equip.org to subscribe. Stay connected with the Christian Research Institute and all the new content we have coming your way. The best way to do that is to head on over to our website, equip.org. There you will find thousands of free resources right at your fingertips, from articles to video to audio, and it's all for free. You'll find our podcasts hosted there as well as the Bible Answer Man broadcast, which is hosted by CRI President Hank Canegraaff and streams live every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. In addition, you don't want to miss out on subscribing to Hank Unplugged, which is the podcast of Hank Canegraaff. And in that podcast, he has really in-depth, free-flowing, essential Christian conversations with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people. And in addition, he has a new series on his podcast feed called Hank Unplugged Shorts, which Hank goes into the headlines in the mainstream media and refutes a lot of those cultural issues that we have in these short podcast episodes. And there's quite a few of them. You don't want to miss out on them. Now, if you want to find some of this at other places where it's all in one place, really subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a great way to get all of our content there, our podcasts there, and different individual questions theologically that people have that Hank answers at our YouTube channel. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't know how to subscribe to YouTube. I don't have a YouTube account. Well, actually, you might just have a YouTube account. If you have a Gmail address, you have a YouTube account. Just log into YouTube with your Gmail address and search for Bible Answer Man channel, and please become one of our subscribers. Stay connected with the Christian Research Institute and all the new content we have coming your way. The best way to do that is to head on over to our website, equip.org. There you will find thousands of free resources right at your fingertips, from articles to video to audio, and it's all for free. You'll find our podcasts hosted there as well as the Bible Answer Man broadcast, which is hosted by CRI President Hank Canegraaff and streams live every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. In addition, you don't want to miss out on subscribing to Hank Unplugged, which is the podcast of Hank Canegraaff. And it's in that podcast, he has really in-depth, free-flowing, essential Christian conversations with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people. And in addition, he has a new series on his podcast feed called Hank Unplugged Shorts, which Hank goes into the headlines in the mainstream media and refutes a lot of those cultural issues that we have in these short podcast episodes. And there's quite a few of them. You don't want to miss out on them. Now, if you want to find some of this at other places where it's all in one place, really subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a great way to get all of our content there, our podcasts there, and different individual questions theologically that people have that Hank answers at our YouTube channel. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't know how to subscribe to YouTube. I don't have a YouTube account. Well, actually, you might just have a YouTube account. If you have a Gmail address, you have a YouTube account. Just log into YouTube at, in your, with your Gmail address and search for Bible Answer Man channel, and please become one of our subscribers. In addition, if you see that bell icon right there on our front page, please click that. And every time that we have new content, you will receive a notification that new content is up on our channel for you to be able to consume. So thank you so much for the ways in which you partner with the Christian Research Institute. We are grateful for you listening and reading and watching. In addition, if you see that bell icon right there on our front page, please click that. And every time that we have new content, you will receive a notification that new content is up on our channel for you to be able to consume. So thank you so much for the ways in which you partner with the Christian Research Institute. 
We are grateful for you listening and reading and watching. Mm-hmm.